Um, what's been happening as this club has developed over the years, so everybody started off with their own small robots. And then they said, well, we've already done this. Let's do a bigger robot. And as the robots got bigger, it took longer and longer to build. Okay, so for example, the last big robot I built took me three and a half years. Um, and uh, so people stopped showing the robots. A, a new, new thing that's occurring in the club is te teams of people are getting together to build a robot that reduces the amount of time required to build a robot. Plus you can get a synergistic um, um, team of people together. Some people are good at software, hardware, electronics, what have, what have you. So uh, Ubiquity Robotics is one of these teams, okay? It's basically pretty open for people to, to show up and uh, work on. So if you're kind of interested in it, uh, the right person to talk to is David Crawley. Can't miss him. He's, 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 he's our basketball player. <laughs> um, and um, the other team I mentioned is the Max Stout team. They're kind of finishing up for now. I don't know what's going to happen down the road with Max Stout. But my assumption is if they win, lose, or the, the, the whole project is canceled, they'll find some other robot to work on. So that's another team that, that people can join. So I just wanted to let people know that that's kind of what's starting to happen in this club. And so with no further ado, I'm going to let <coughs> Alan tell us all about Ubiquity Robotics. Thank you very much. Is this good? Can you hear me without the microphone? Is that, yeah. Can you hear me in the back? Is that good? Yes? No? Everyone hear me? Okay. Seriously? Your deep, booming voice sounds great, Alan. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I practice a lot. Right. So I'm talking today about... Oops, I lost the mic. Pass it. <laughs> Good, I think I lost the mic. So, let's see. Ubiquity Robotics started around two and a half, was it three years ago? Two and a half years ago, when this uh, tall Englishman came in and challenged us. And uh, we were pretty close to releasing what I think is going to be a uh, landmark project. So, I'm going to concentrate on. Uh, the whole project. I'm going to pay particular attention to the software element of it. And so uh, if there are a couple of boring software slides in there, please excuse me. But I think that's important because it pulls the whole uh, product together. So the question I'm going to ask you is, what would you do with your own personal robot? And that's the question for the talk. So why, why are we doing this? About 30 years ago, is longer than that, is when the first personal computers started coming up. Nobody really knew what the application for them was. Uh, I'm going to say the same thing about personal robots. Nobody really knows what the application for them will be, but they have to exist before that application is developed. So you know, around 30 years ago, I got my Osborne 1. Uh, did a little word processing on it. I sent a letter to my sister that I had to uh, put a stamp on in mail because there was no email. And she wrote back a letter saying, wow, you have a personal computer. Personal robots will be just around the corner. <laughs> well, it's been 35 years, and I'm done waiting. I'm done waiting. We're done waiting. So my hypothesis is that if a widely available, affordable, adaptable, and capable developer's platform, if that happened, there'd be a revolution and widespread acceptance of personal robots will follow soon thereafter. <coughs> Problem is, you can't buy a you know, reasonable developer's platform today. Uh, if you had 400, well, even if you have 400,000K or 40K, you can't get a PR2, you can't get an Unbounded. Maybe you'll be able to get a Fetch robot uh, in a bit or uh, a Baxter in a bit. Uh, Baxter on wheels. Baxter on wheels, yeah. Uh, and I don't know what they cost, but they are not 
certainly in the realm of a personal robot. <coughs> and uh, I guess on the low end, you can get a, uh, a turtle, you get a turtle bot that has, you know, very limited capability. Uh, or on the very low end, you get a single purpose robot that's good for vacuuming on the floor. That's really neat. The Nito is a Nito robot. I love it. I use it all the time. It's very good at vacuuming the floor, but it can't go into the next room if there's a closed door in front of it. Uh, Roomba, well, it's, you know, we take Roombas apart and make them into experimental <laughs> robots, right? And uh, Roomba's capability is limited. A Roomba can bring you a can of beer, right? So that's not very, and it can't open the refrigerator door, so it can't do anything truly useful. So. Uh, it, it doesn't exist yet. And what we want is Rosie, or uh, when people say, I want a personal robot, this is what comes to mind. And that's what we want, but what we have, or what we can get, especially for developers and hobbyists, are Roomba and Turtlebot. They're not very capable. What is needed is a developer's platform with meaningful capability, and that's, that's what our, our goal is. So, first part, building a robot, you have to build the hardware. And that's hard, right? How many, you know, especially when you get to a bigger robot, attaching the wheel to the motor is very difficult. It's not simple. And if you want to actually measure the rotations of the wheel, adding an encoder to it is very difficult. So you start off, I want to build a robot that can open a door, right? I'm trying 10 years to do that and I still don't have a good solution to do that. Then, once I have the mechanical ability to do something, I have to program it, and I have to start all that software and develop it all from scratch. <coughs> well, software is a difficult challenge, even more of a challenge than doing the hardware. Uh, fortunately, Willow Garage developed a software called ROS, it's a robot operating system. So the software, which is probably 80% or 90% of the effort in developing a robot that can move autonomously around your house, uh, that's been shortcut. It's done. It's open source. So we'll go through the boring computer stuff. You know, this is engineering talk. What's important for people who are actually working on it, it's open source based on Linux. It'll uh, work with Ubuntu. It's designed to work with Ubuntu 14.04, which is also, you know, open source. Uh, and uh, you can run it on an ARM uh, computer like a, a Raspberry Pi 2 very easily. You can run it on a $45 uh, computer and run it successfully on a $45 computer. That makes it you know, very affordable. Now, ROS is an OS, and what does that mean? There was no Google until there was uh, a browser and an HTTP server. Right? There's no Amazon, nothing. Those things have to exist. You have to have a robot, a software infrastructure to actually build things upon. So in personal computers, right, first it was CPM, then it was MS-DOS, then it developed from there. But those things had to exist. Once CPM came about, there was a plethora of these small personal systems. And then finally it you know, sort of collapsed down towards one operating system. But there had to be a starting <coughs> point where there's an operating system where somebody could write an application, it would work on all those different computers. So you, we need to think of ROS as an operating system like an MS-DOS that they can build robot applications upon. So, you know, for developers and for people who are actually starting it, it's a, it's a steep learning curve. But we saw with the Odroid people here, now they're doing interfaces on top of that that makes that all that difficulty and complexity transparent to the end user. They just see, they just see a browser and they just click buttons and away it goes. So uh, you know, Ross has a lot of neat things in it. What's important in my mind are the fact that they have these packages that do diagnostics that do, and we'll talk a little bit about this, mostly important is the localization mapping navigation. These are challenging software, cha challenging software things, and there are nodes already uh, that exist. 
So for example, uh, we wanted to use a XV11 LiDAR on our robot, and the software already exists. You know, the hardware is already written. You just take that software node, and you can get it <coughs> on your robot very quickly. So why is the, the pose important? If you have a robot that needs to do things like pick up a glass or something like that, it has to know where all the geometry between all the joints, and then it has to do the path planning so it doesn't knock <coughs> over the dishes while it's picking up the cup. And all that is in ROS. The other thing is uh, the mapping. So we talk <coughs> about SLAM, which means simultaneous location and mapping. And that's a difficult challenge. If you want to be, to be able to move a robot around the house autonomously, it has to know where it is, it has to figure out a path, it has to avoid obstacles, and sometimes those things are, are different things. You need different sensors to do that. But the software is already there. So some of the important uh, ROS tools that uh, we use an awful lot are the uh, visualization environment, so you actually sort of conceptualize, see the robot actually move in space. And then there's uh, RQT where you actually can hook sensors up and actually see <coughs> sort of act as like an oscilloscope for sensors. So you actually see what's coming off the sensors. So these things really help us when we uh, develop. Uh, ROS is uh, widespread. One of the interesting robots that use ROS is the, na the I don't know if it's pronounced, the Nao humanoid little French humanoid, which is a fairly sophisticated yeah. robot, is based on ROS. So all that's interesting. So the software <coughs> part of it is mostly taken care of. So the next question I have is, why do we think we're ready to do this now? And we'll go to a little history. So we'll go back to uh, computers in the 70s, when this club started, right? 84, we weren't 70s. Well, our predecessor club, the Homebrew Computer Club, started in the 70s. Right? That's correct. And we were a SIG from that club. So the, our, our ancestor club. So what was the situation in the 70s, right? We had mainframes on the high end, high, highly flexible, highly expensive. Uh, do you remember when you had to get special permission to go into the computer center? Right. They didn't let just anybody go in there. It's like, and you had to have a white coat to go in. It was pretty important. You had to submit your job through a <coughs> window because you couldn't actually do it yourself. Okay, that was the high end. And the low end, we had calculators that were four function calculators. The first ones cost 400 bucks, by the way. <laughs> you don't realize that. And then, when both the high end and the low end existed, we started getting these hobbyist built systems that were uh, difficult to manufacture uh, and uh, fairly expensive. I forget what the first Apple II's cost. I think it was around $2,000, right? More than that? Yeah, it was expensive. It's 2000 in 1972 dollars, which would be like 5000 now. Yeah, the Altair 8800, which was the alternative, yeah, which didn't do as much as the Apple II, I think, was six hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, it was okay. Yeah, didn't do much of anything. That's six hundred fifty in nineteen seventy. That is correct. Yeah, it was big, right? I think my salary during that time, my stipend was five thousand a year. So you got it. Yeah. So, so the low-cost general-purpose <coughs> machine is possible when both the high end and the low end exist. You know, homebrew <laughs> enthusiasts were the first to enter the market with difficult to uh, manufacture designs. So the opportunity exists. So now look at robots in 2015. I think we have a similar situation. We have on the low end, Roomba, right? I won't put needle, needle on the low end. There's camps here. Yeah. Yeah. Low flexibility and low cost. And we have the high end, we have the uh, ASIMO and the PR2. So what comes in next? <laughs> so we have, yeah, we have like hobbyists who have this one-off that can do something like Robo Magellan. No offense. Rusty. Rusty. 
Yeah, right. So how, how many how many <laughs> Rusties are there? So what comes next? Okay, we are proposing that something like this comes in next. So one of the keys is how do you make something like that affordable? How? How do you make it affordable? So we already talked about the software part. That's the major part of development. That's taken, boom, that's cut your cost. You use advanced uh, off-the-shelf technology, stuff that's already available. And uh, we apply an agile methodology. We use open source uh, tools like uh, Trello, Slack, GitHub uh, for our development. So we're, we're, we're lean. I'm so lean, I'm losing weight. <laughs> and the product is designed around the existing supply chain, not vice versa. So what, what are we doing? We call this the Magni. The Magni or Magni, I don't know. Whatever, robotics platform. And so Magni, 100 pound payload, Eight hours endurance, navigate in ADA compliant space, widely adaptable for useful work. Again, you define what useful is, and affordable. And uh, we originally called this was Project Hercules, and we developed it as we do in homebrew by his stage challenges. So we had the labor of Hercules. I think labor one was drive a Roomba around three cones. And labor 12, which we haven't done yet, was to survive for a week, return to charging station, wander a uh, fixed space, identify a person non grata, and complain. So we haven't done 12 yet, but uh, we've done at least six or seven of the challenges successfully. So our first <coughs> effort, Hercules V1, was based on an electric wheelchair, weighed around 150 pounds, the motors were around 20 pounds each, had two big automobile lead acid batteries in it, and we did have a fairly successful, fun, uh, ROS-based application called PartyBot. Now PartyBot used a camera doing face recognition, would go up to a person, an unsuspecting civilian, and start talking, and it would pitch Coca-Cola to them. So we actually got some money from Coca-Cola. So say, and we got a really it was a, a young woman from the Hacker Dojo had a really, you know, sexy voice. As that, so it was kind of fun. And you know, just the reaction to people were pretty cool. We quickly decided that a wheelchair was not what we wanted, and we concentrated our design <coughs> using brushless hub motors. So brushless hub motors, if you're not familiar with them, have three leads and Hall effect sensors, and the motor is internal to the wheel, so it takes a very little space. You can you see them when we'll show you the platform. And uh, so it solves a lot of the problems. You don't have to worry about attaching an axle. You don't have to attach motor. You don't have to do external encoders, because the encoders are already there. So that's uh, a good, and they're mass produced. They're readily available and very inexpensive. Uh, we had to build a custom uh, electronic speed control. And that's probably the most challenging hardware electrical engineering part of the, of the problem. And uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. We started out with a steel chassis. Now we've gone to aluminum. We're using uh, rear casters. Then we debated this. The size and actually the shape and how it has been carefully researched to be able to turn easily inside a standard doorway. Uh, we use uh, ARM-based uh, CPUs and we use wherever available uh, off-the-shelf uh, sensor technology. And we've researched other things and this is what we're, we're doing now. That's all it has uh, sealed that acid, I'm sorry if I didn't. Okay, so the most challenging part of the whole integration is navigation. That's because navigation sensors are uh, pretty expensive, right? You can't really buy an inexpensive LiDAR yet. Maybe someday in the future there'll be uh, 
inexpensive uh, 3D cameras, but not yet. So what our uh, solution for navigation is, is we use uh, sonar sensors for <coughs> obstacle avoidance and an upward looking camera looking at ceiling fiducials for navigation. And that allows us to uh, live within an ADA compliant space. We've gone through a series of CPUs uh, and uh, had success with some of them, including the Raspberry Pi, but uh, that, that died around electric as far as Indigo. Yeah. Uh, right now we're uh, pretty happy with the Raspberry Pi 2. It seems to have uh, everything we need, plus it has a camera integration in it that makes it very, very affordable, a good, situ a good uh, solution for us. We've gone and looked at a whole bunch of different sensors. Uh, we've uh, experimented with the, uh, the NEDO uh, laser distance sensor, the XG11. That's a very good sensor, but it's not available. Uh, Connect, likewise, works, but again, isn't really available in volume. Uh, looked at special cameras. Uh, we're designing a spe special uh, sonar array that uses both sonars and infrared sensors. And that may be a future addition. Right now we're just using the uh, uh, HES 401s? HCSRO4s. RO4s, which are very inexpensive and we put a lot of them on the robot. And uh, in the future, you know, with things like uh, Project Tango, where they're having really inexpensive 3D cameras in lap in uh, tablets. Eventually, you know these 3D camera technology is going to come down in price, but not yet. So, we've developed specific software for based on ROS by using basically what existed out there and customizing it for our uh, for our nodes. Eventually, when we uh, get this up, we'll put this up in our own uh, build farm. People will be able to refresh using app get, uh, and things like that. So the first 10 of our uh, final platforms are under construction. We have one of them here today. Uh, after we get them working to our satisfaction and reliably, we plan to go forward with a crowdfunding campaign. And uh, right now we're discussing between 300 and 1,000 units. And like the personal computer, we really do not know what the best purpose for the platform will be. <coughs> We've looked at a few use cases, uh, we have some pictures of, but it's up to people like you, you know, early adapters, to come up with killer apps. And maybe it's teleop done well, uh, but uh, I don't know that. So we had, uh, had various, that these are not, I wouldn't say these are mock-ups, these are working versions of the robot. Uh, so Teleop uh, is a sort of like an idea for a seeing eye robot. And then we had a table server, so a concierge, sort of similar to a uh, botler, <coughs> except uh, whatever. That's a little too much detail on that slide. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we have it all uh, catted up in SolidWorks. And now what do we call it? Open Open CAD or what is it, Gil? Uh, on shape. On shape is the uh, is a you've heard it here first. On shape is the next uh, best CAD that next open source CAD package is going to sync SolidWorks. We hope. Okay. So we're probably, when we uh, do the rollout, we'll probably do it in three versions. Uh, we haven't decided on what the final prices are. But uh, base configuration would just be the motors, the chassis, and the controller without a computer. A developer's platform is sort of what we're showing. It has a flat top on it, has the computer and the navigation sensors and stacks. And then we'd want to sell some sort of fancy version with a custom shell that would be almost application ready. Just add your, you know, uh, teleop platform to it, or your arm, and away you go. Okay. So we have uh, two platforms that we're looking at. We're looking at our main platform, the Magni platform. Also, uh, 
Wayne and Mark have been working on a low-end platform for learning Ross, and that's called Loki. I'm going to talk more about that. And uh, here is, here's what Wayne basically uh, wants to tell you about Loki. It's a small robot designed to teach you about Ross. Runs on a Raspberry Pi 2, and we have a robot there that I guess we have two versions there. We have the fully loaded one with the arm and the upward looking camera. And then we have one that's a little less sophisticated. Again, the exact price points of these haven't been uh, decided, but it will be very affordable. Okay, so our question still is, what would you do with your own personal robot. Thank you. I guess it's now time for demos. <coughs> While Wayne's getting warmed up here, he asked me to talk briefly about this little uh, Loki project, which is, uh, like he said, going to be more or less the uh, learning platform. You want some kind of base to get going with. You want to robot together but you're really much more much more interested in the software side of it and you don't want to dork around with all the hardware so this is running full-blown Ross Raspberry Pi 2 has an up-facing camera it can do the uh, ceiling fiducial uh, recognition we have the packages that can navigate and make maps right now we're not going to show that today it's too complicated we have all the mechanical stuff to bring uh, this is also believe it or not scanning you right now with its little sonars and so these are very tried and true devices, but the interesting thing about these little sonar units now, they've dropped to a basically a buck a piece, which is shakunk in the curve. I mean, they are like dirt cheap now. Like if I had a problem with one, I'd just take it aside or throw it away. <laughs> so uh, these are all running around right now, uh, and uh, that's what Wayne's getting ready to show you. Uh, they're running around right now and doing uh, data gathering for each sonar uh, that goes all around the unit. And then this guy, can also uh, do some driving. Now, um, this one has some issues with driving, so I'm going to be careful here and make sure it doesn't fall off the table. But uh, in short, it does your basic driving type moves, uh, and uh, and that's that's about it. <laughs> Let's see, it rotates in some way. <laughs> so. It drives around, but it has the whole Ross and everything in it, and uh, then it has this nice little claw arm on it, which I saw on the web, and I really want one, but they're not in, in, in uh, production anymore. But anybody know what this particular color of robot arm is called? How about Heisenberg Blue? Think about it. <laughs> That's what they call it on their page. Uh, right now, we also have a joystick interface on all the bots, uh, and basically that's a classic tried and true uh, joy node, which is available from Ross already, and then we just built a package to sit on top of that and pull stuff in. We have custom buttons. These buttons are the go-to nav points. Uh, we just have them set up to do uh, <coughs> move-based commands to the bot to make it move pre predetermined and everything like that. Uh, for those of you who know uh, about these... Um, move bases when you have a map and you know you can navigate and you want to go from where you are to some other place you, you give it this command and you say I want to go right there so we got some of those pre-programmed uh, and then the joystick and a couple of other fun things so that's it uh, how are you doing Wayne I need to do okay the we're gonna move on to Magni <laughs> Jim's gonna show you Magni why don't, why don't you get it in the middle so they can see down the aisle or something and, uh, this one runs a lot smoother, but we're still trying to figure out the joystick controls, so we're... Good luck, Jim. <laughs> it's really smooth running. Those wheels quiet. that was been said, basically, been holding out. It's really quiet. It's, it, those are wonderful wheels, and, and the thing just uh, uh, cruises around. Uh, with the, you know, notice how smooth that is. There. Yeah. yeah, you can't hear it, so you don't yeah. know where it is. <laughs> Actually, when it backs up, we're going to get a little beep, 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 beep. We haven't installed that just yet. <laughs> just in case you're wondering, this is running at about 5% of the time. Oh, okay. 
Um, maybe, maybe well, I, all the time. They probably again. do it. So, so you know, you know that what, I mean, what may happen is we may have to uh, shut the talk down. Yeah, and, we're going to bail in five the, minutes. If Ross and if, if this PC and Ross itself doesn't have the same time within a few seconds, then what happens is Ross Arviz gets the messages and said, "Oh, that data is just way too old," or "Oh, that data is in the future. I'm not going to use it," and so <coughs> it doesn't show us what's yeah. going on. And I will mention that this platform has a real-time clock put on it. But we haven't gotten that software working yet. Yeah. Okay, so we know about this problem, but the, the workaround is we have to type in the date and time on the robot because it thinks it's not. What? No, no, no. no see, he, <laughs> well, we have no network connected. Here we are in front of a room, and Jim says, "Why don't we configure NTP?" It's like. Yeah. You can synchronize. So, <laughs> yeah. so actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check my astronomy site and find out what the UTC time is, and we're going to say date, space, uh, that, and that month, work. day, etc. Okay. So, so let me just br briefly do just a teeny bit of fill here. Um, this platform is basically, I wasn't really planning on doing it, um, but it was sort of somebody said, well, we could probably do this platform. And what the, the problem is, you have all of these universities where the students are saying, well, robots, they're hot, okay? And they don't have any uh, robot to instruct the students with, okay? The, the least expensive robot they can find is something called a turtle bot, which costs about uh, $1,500. You're not going to buy a lab full of those. Um, I, well, I don't know what the final cost of this will be. My gut feeling is it's going to be somewhere in the $300, $400 range, maybe less. Uh, you don't get the arm um, and you drop a few other things. Um, so that's really the concept behind this is to make a, a platform that people can learn on. The thing I really want to hammer home, though, is all these platforms will run the same software stack. This has the upward-facing camera that we use for ceiling fiducials. Magni's can have an upward-facing camera. We have a third robot, which we aren't even showing tonight, called Freya. It has upward-facing camera. We're going to run uniform software across all these robots so that basically once you get something working on here and you say, ah, now I have my basic application working, now maybe I want to get a, a higher-duty, heavier payload platform pay a little more money and get it working on that. So that's kind of the, the concept we're going here is to give, give, a, give something that people can get started on. The uh, other issue was the, um, 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 when you're doing a Kickstarter, if the only rewards you have cost 500 to $1,000, you're not going to get very many people to sign up for you. So we wanted to have something that had a lower price point that we could offer as rewards. So that was the other concept that was going in there. Have you been able to set up? Uh, well, I don't know where your screen was for the RV. Okay. Which one is it? Yeah, I, had, it was, I killed it. Okay. If this works, <coughs> it works. It we might actually be in the future now, even if it's by a few. Uh, Tony, if you're like, how far in the future can you be and still have it recognize the topic message? Uh, probably less than a second. Ah, crud. <laughs> In the past, it's more tolerant, right? Uh, it depends. I would say, I, would, I don't know. I would actually believe it would be the same for both sides. Wow, but we were incredibly lucky. Earlier today, we just, well, we were watching the clock and said, give it three seconds of lead time, and then bam, hit enter. So we were probably, may have hit the window. Has it done type a time, some random time in both computers, you can enter at the same time? Yeah, but then they take 15 seconds to return. So we're not going to hold you too long for this. This is going to either work or it's not. And uh, we do have a, a bitmap of it when it was working, but it doesn't show you dynamically your hand in front and stuff. Mm, it's not working. It's because of probability you went up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that one, that, that demo so is, is... Let's take questions then. Oh, but do you have the bitmap? Uh, I don't have it right now. Oh. Okay, so we're just going to have that. Then we have less credibility, but... <laughs> well, we'll show it later as, as we get figure out the times. So, yes? So as, as far as primary sensors go, did you experiment with stereo vision at all, or like two cameras? You know, um, no. Uh, it's really hard to find stereo cameras. Well, I mean, just like two separate webcams and just try to sync them together. Yeah, we, we were using something called point gray cameras, which could be synchronized. 
but you know, we didn't we didn't really go there. You know, you're talking a fairly complicated software stack to do the the software uh, resolution, uh, and we're not the most powerful processor on there. Okay, uh, it's a 900 megahertz ARM7 quad core on the Pi 2. On the Pi 2, it does have an FPU on it, a GPU, but that's we don't really know. It's closed source. Yeah. So you don't really know what, how much acceleration we're going to get. So, you know, we just, it didn't feel like a good uh, direction to go. Yeah, and if you're using something like a 3D camera, okay. or using the optical, oh, mm -hmm. so we will just show a picture. go <coughs> 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 Okay, so if this will come up. Have a munch on some So, if you're using a small, really small ARM processor, you can't do a lot of vision processing on it. So, if like if you want to do something like stereo cameras, it's possible to do that, but you have to put a more powerful processor on board. The alternative is you can offload the vision processing to another computer that's off, you know, through Wi-Fi. So. Something like a, a N NVIDIA TK1 that has a, you know floating point acceleration you might be able to do yeah like a Tegra yeah that might do it. Tegra is having a little kernel issues so uh, you know we looked at that and the same thing with even with a you know uh, Kinect something a 3D camera you need a little more processing I don't know Raspberry Pi 2 might do it. Uh, Beaglebone, Beaglebone Black, probably not, not enough. So we're just going to pause. This is a screenshot of what our sonars look like. Okay, yeah. If you could get a, a, a LiDAR, oops, you just took it away. It was up there on the screen. Go figure. The rough mic. You guys saw the cones of objectivity, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, what that was showing was the um, uh, the sonars. The reason why we're using sonars is what we really like to do is use a LiDAR, but we can't get a cheap LiDAR. But I can buy 16 sonars for $16, basically. And that will give us a low-resolution LiDAR. Tell us we have obstacles in front of ourselves or, and, and stuff like and that. It's cheaper to buy 16 or even 30 than to buy one and put it on the platform that swings back and forth because that would be no, more. No, they're, they're down at a buck, you know, come on. Right. So, so anyhow, that's, that's what you're seeing there is the, uh, the various sonar cones. And, um, and then if, it's, if there's nothing in front of it, it goes blank, okay? So it, it, you don't, don't see the cone. If it's out of range. If it's out of range. What's the orange cone? I set the orange cone up so I knew which one was sonar one. And that's, and that's, that's the only purpose of the color. And I think that's, that's running sense. a subset of the sensors. So we, we have a black area back we have a black, there. We have a black we're just, area. We're just looking at like eight of them there or something yeah. like yeah, that. Yeah, we're only, only looking at 11 sonars there. So do you have to uh, serialize them so that they don't interfere with each other? Yes, we do. Okay. What kind of distance is that? Oh, that was... Probably about no more than a meter. After a meter, it just goes out of range. And Can you tell us some about your electronic speed control? Sure. Who, who wants to talk about the speed control? Rohan. Let Rohan, talk Rohan about actually speech. worked on the circuit board, one yeah. of the early circuit yeah. boards. So. They want to know about the motor control board. So the motor control board. In, um, it runs an ARM CPU with a low-cost 32-bit microcontroller on it, and it uses MOSFETs to control the three pins that need to be controlled on a brushless DC motor. And it takes in the Hall effect input that the motors give, so that tells us what speed the motors are currently going at. And then the CPU decides, well, the motors are going kind of too slow that, uh, for what we want it to go, so it will speed up using this algorithm called PID. Yeah. Are you using a practical drive on that? Yes, we are. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. The new version is using a trapezoidal drive. The um, <coughs> motor controller <coughs> has <coughs> been <coughs> spent quite a lot of time on the motor controller to get um, designed to cost right. So, you know, because our our platform has been so cost sensitive, we've really oh. packed quite a lot um, into the motor controller with with a, a very low cost. So oh. we have. Um, we have no doubt. We are we're Google Guest. Dual three um, three channel uh, gate drivers driving a uh, each motor has of course three half H bridges um, that uh, drive the, uh, the the motors, all of which have been optimized for cost. The microcontroller itself um, is a device that has an onboard CPLD, so the lookup tables for the, um, <coughs> the brushless DC. Uh, Brushless DC are all in hardware, all right, so it's a completely hardware-driven design. Um, and then the um, the all that the microcontroller has to do is is uh, run the PID loop and talk to the uh, to the main computer. Um, it also has uh, redundant power supplies on it for five and twelve volts. So it has um, yeah, we've got uh, four power supplies on board. Um, each power supply can comfortably supply seven amps of power. So two of those power supplies are purely for external use. Two of them are joint board use and external use. So there's plenty of DC power on board for, for all the applications that you want to put on board. Um, and uh, you are bought, we've done the work to try to get the design cost down so that you guys don't have to do that. So you can buy the controllers if you want to buy the controller, um, potentially that's, that's something we can talk about. We initially <coughs> anticipated that people would want to buy the um, would want to buy the low-end platform, which is the controller plus the wheels that it's it's uh, it's uh, designed for. Um, also has the the uh, the, you know, the, the the chassis. Um, the you know, we worked on design to cost of the chassis too, so not that much more for the chassis plus the plus the motor controller and the wheels. But if you really want the motor controller plus the wheels, everybody really wants it, then we'll offer it, right? Okay. So, uh, so yeah. We're going, we don't need you. What's that? <laughs> you don't want wheels, you just <laughs> Yeah, unless I want their uh, humanoid to ride a skateboard. You only want the motor controller? Yeah, we're doing our own servo. Yeah, we don't need the motor controller. Right. I'm sure that our brushless controller will be a lot less pricey than anything that you'll be able to get. Source code Unfortunately, um, there is oh, a tiny is little bit of source code for this the. Um, no. There's a tiny little bit of uh, source code for the um, for the microcontroller that I cannot open source. So I was told when I got it because um, I'm using some undocumented um, calls in the in the um, microcontroller in order to enable built-in self-test. And that um, piece of code I'm not supposed to release um, under agreement. But um, if you really want to get access to the source code for the motor controller, then let's talk. Okay. Because maybe you don't need built in self-test. Yeah, maybe, you need, maybe, you need, maybe you don't need built in self-test, or maybe there's some, some way we can work together. All right. The other thing is that board is basically a surface mount board, but it's one sided surface mount board. So yep. it's designed to be, you know, field repairable. Yeah, it's a <coughs> single sided. We, place, we only place components on one side to try to cost, to try to reduce cost. We protect it to a two layer board to try to reduce cost. We have worked on the cost of every component on there, to try to keep the cost down in order to meet our goal of trying to produce a low cost robotics platform. Right. What's it cost you? What's that? What's your cost? Um, the motor controller cost. Um, should, should we take that off or right just, just We can take that offline, but yeah. <laughs> but, but um, it's 
we're getting very good pricing on this, right? You know, many nights of me calling China to, to try to get this good pricing. Okay. Further questions? Yeah. Pardon? When it's ready? Yeah, but, you know, this year. It's a handle. It's a handle. So, so you want to be able to pick the robot up, yeah? Right? Um, it depends on the batteries that you want to put in there. Um, what's that? This one, um, 30 or 40. I think this one's about 30 pounds. You can go for lighter weight batteries. So, I've taken a model similar to this with batteries and taken it as carry on luggage. Um, stows nicely in an overhead bin, by the way. Um, the, uh, and I had actually no problems through the TS, through TSA security with it. Um, if you get the model with the 36 amp hour battery, um, that's going to be a 75 pound robot. So um, we have been using these 10, 10 amp hour batteries, but the um, motor controllers are quite efficient. We've been able to drive around all day without needing to recharge. Um, if you wanted to sort of do long distance errands, you might want to have the 36 amp hour batteries. Otherwise, the uh, only foreseeable reason why you'd want 36 amp hour batteries is for ballast. Um, but it will take them. It will take them. It has been designed around 36 amp hour batteries. <coughs> is there any sensing of the battery? Uh, yes, there is. So we've got um, you know, sensing to, to, t to test the health of the battery. So you prevent discharge problems? Mainly just for, you know, do I need to recharge kind of questions to the, to the motor controller, right? You know, so that you can send a command to the, it's all handled through the, that one controller board. Because like I said, we put all that functionality on the one board so that we could keep the cost down. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the motor controller, you send a signal to the motor controller saying, is my how full is my battery, and it will come back to you with a with an answer. Um, so uh, so yeah. Although so yeah, out of the many bugs that we have debugged, that's not one that we have actively tested. So <coughs> it's up to the user to sense the battery and not over discharge it. It's up to the user to not to not do that. But like I say, we we drive this around all day. I plug it into my I, we plug it into our 24 amp uh, charger and then. A few minutes later, it's fully charged. So we're not, we're not, we're not, you know, we don't tend to to run the battery down much. Maybe we need to drive it around a lot more or, or carry heavy loads. It's using the sealed lead acid because you need the ballast. Right. But so you put a big mast on, it's going to be. Oh no! Doesn't sound good. Yeah. See, they commanded the motor to go. No, no, there's, there's, there's no dead zone on this. So if that happens again, just flip the joystick and yeah. it on because there's no dead zone. So it's getting like this really small signal. And yeah. Kind of like, oh, okay. So like I say, you know, the motors are brushless DC motors. They're very efficient. You know, excess current goes back into the into the batteries. I mean, you really do not use all, you really do not use a lot of power on this. One of the biggest power uses is actually the you know, if you plug in a Tegra, if you plug in a, a Tegra K1, then, then then you actually start to run the battery down quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Gil can probably we 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 say um, we say above 100 kilos, but Gil, what? What, what do you think it will really fail at? Is that 100 pounds on the slides? We say sometimes, that. what's that? So I think he's being a little bit conservative, but it can handle quite a lot more than we, we, we put Something on. Like a full keg or a pony keg or whatever. <laughs> say well, that's a joke, right? A turtle bot can bring you a can of beer. This can bring you the keg. This can bring you the keg. So, so actually, that's so my uh, that's my killer app, keg bot. You just have a keg on it with a spigot so and uh, glasses. We 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 we're a little bit conservative on the payload because, you know, our, our testing in our testing we've taken this 
sort of off-road, we take it outside over, over pebbles, and I haven't tested it to failure yet with the, with, you know, 100 kilo plus loads yet. But um, the theory looks good. The structural analysis looks good. So, uh, so yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. As usual, we're going to try to do demos. Something goes wrong. Okay, so, um, so with that, what we're going to do is go into what we call random access, which is our way of saying we just talk, we just talk to one another. Somebody turned off my mic. <laughs> so, thank you for coming, and Next month will be our 13th annual Robot Tabletop Challenge. Please come, bring robots if you can. Thank you.